Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Gannat, for inviting me uh, this afternoon. And thank you, uh, uh, Jan and Mika, for your stimulating and informative presentations. Uh, I've been asked to speak on uh, the topic of homo spiritus, which means uh, spiritual human being. Uh, this is actually inseparable from another uh, cousin species called Homo pacificus, uh, or peaceful human being. So I'm going to actually be talking about both of them kind of in the same breath, because they, in essence, go together. We talk about uh, peaceful spiritual humanity. Um, and I prepared a slideshow, which I'd like to now go into. Uh, so please bear with me as we share the screen. Okay, is that uh, visible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. All right, last uh, autumn, uh, I visited Santorini, the Greek island in the Aegean that was the hub of the ancient Minoan civilization, and Gobeki Tepe and Catalhoyuk in Turkey. These cultures, dating thousands of years ago, were entirely peaceful and harmonious. It was a revelation to visit the archaeological sites and to actually walk through the streets of these ancient places. The art was entirely naturalistic, primarily paintings and sculptures of animals, plants, humans, sun, moon, and stars. There were no gods or spirits, no rulers or priests, no weapons or battles depicted on the amazing murals, walls, and ceramics. The cookware and the storage vessels had beautiful paintings of barley and wheat, of flowers and trees, of porpoises and octopi. I felt that I was visiting another world, a world of health and peace, an earthly paradise, a heavenly realm in which people live together in harmony for millennia after millennia, with no weapons, war, or conflict, no rulers, priests, or soldiers. This picture uh, in this slide is of me and then my uh, wife, Danka, and it's taken in front of the excavation at Gobeki Tepe in central Anatolia in Turkey, site of the world's earliest megalithic agriculture. It goes back nearly 12,000 years and it was prepared by hunter-gatherers, or what I prefer to call them gatherer-hunters, uh, who were eating primarily wild emmer, a type of wheat, and wild barley. Because about 75 to 80% of the traditional diet was from gathering or foraging, I prefer to put the term gather in front of hunter because hunting uh, or fishing accounted for a very small amount of the food in traditional uh, human society in existence. Okay, in contrast uh, to these very peaceful places, the great Greek and uh, Turkish empires, as well as empires and other places around the world and the great city-states of the past have, by and large, a heavy dark aura. The myths, legends, art, and architecture tell stories of the love and the hates of the gods and the goddesses, of the wars of the mortals and their enemies, and the fear and dread associated with religious dogma, sacrifice, and ritual. The art and architecture is saturated with bloodthirsty scenes of gods and demons, of victorious armies and captured slaves. The Parthenon in Athens, for example, has sculpted art depicting the founder of the city, 
who sacrificed his daughter to the gods for divine blessings. That is the foundation of Greek society. This side, slide uh, on the left shows Akrotiri, the 4,000 uh, year old ancient city on Santorini uh, among, with the Minoans, uh, which was excavated just over the last generation. And this particular slide shows the urns, the large uh, vessels of stored barley uh, with beautiful paintings on the urns. Um, this ancient city was destroyed overnight in a great uh, volcanic eruption in about uh, 1600 BCE. And it wiped out uh, Santorini, and then the tidal waves were 100 feet tall, and they then proceeded over to Crete and pretty much wiped out the Minoan civilization. And then it was taken over by uh, the Greeks from mainland Greece. And so it disappeared, uh, except in myth and in memory, and may have been the Atlantis that uh, Plato later wrote about. Okay, the picture on the right, in sharp contrast, uh, is a picture of Danka in front of the walls of Troy. And Troy, of course, was the site of the Trojan War, the great war that is uh, the subject of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And this war took place roughly 1200 BCE. And we had the opportunity on our trip to visit uh, this site. And it was totally amazing because there are about 10 levels of excavation. And as we learned, each one followed the other following a catastrophe. Most cases it was warfare, but in other cases it was fire or arson, and in others still it was earthquakes. So, and these walls are five feet thick because they were defensive fortifications because they lived in an era of tremendous uh, uh, warfare and carnage. So again, diametrically opposite to the Minoan civilizations or the Anatolian civilizations elsewhere throughout Turkey. In Sanskrit, the word for war, gavisti, means desire for cows. And it harkens back to the age of pastoralism, sedentism, farming, and the domestication of livestock. Prior to this time, war was rare. Anthropologist Raymond Kelly states, early hunter-gatherer societies were warless and the Paleolithic era extending from about 3 million years ago to 10,000 years ago was a time of universal peace. There were scattered cases of violent death during this long era, but with just a handful of exceptions, virtually no archeological evidence of massacre or war during this time. As for interpersonal violence, it was also rare and uncommon. Historian Peter Stearns, who has reviewed all of the evidence, concluded the striking fact is that death by violence is suggested in only four of 110 fossil sites left by early humans. That's less than 3%. In contrast with this long period of peace and harmony, prehistoric era, there have been an estimated 14,500 years, 14,500 wars over the last 5,000 years. That's about three on average per year. Estimates of lives lost, including those from famine and disease and that typically accompany war, range from 1.2 to 3.5 billion people. This bloody legacy has naturally led many people 
in modern times to conclude that human beings are innately violent and that aggression, conflict, and war are an inevitable aspect of life and will always be with us. Since the time of Charles Darwin and evolutionary theory, it has been thought that human beings descended from the great apes, especially chimpanzees that exhibit a high degree of violent behavior in the wild. The aggressiveness by our close evolutionary cousin has been widely cited as a model for human development and appears to provide a biological explanation for humanity's long history of interpersonal violence, domination of females, and for warfare. In recent years, however, it has been discovered that humans are more closely related to bonobos, a lesser known variety of ape that has, been, that has shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees. In the wild, the bonobos are extremely peaceful, avoiding violence in the troop and with outsiders and preferring to resolve disputes by initiating sexual contact. Franz de Waal, a Dutch primatologist, describes bonobo society as altruistic, compassionate, empathetic, kind, patient, and sensitive. It is also matriarchal, with females of the species taking the lead. In contrast, chimpanzees are patriarchal, males dominate females, and troops send out all male hunting expeditions to seek meat. They're highly territorial and will kill other males. Based on gene sequencing, researchers report that humans share slightly more DNA with bonobos than with chimpanzees. And other studies have found that humans share 1.6% of the DNA only with the bonobos, not with chimpanzees. So what this translates into is closer mus musculature, brain size, metabolism, and social behavior. Bonobos are omnivorous, eating primarily fruit, leaves, bark, stems, roots, and other plant foods, and just a small amount of insect, worms, crustaceans, honey, eggs, or other animal products. Chimpanzees, in contrast, consume substantially more meat and animal food, including their infants of their own species. This fascinating newly discovered primate heritage suggests that genetically, early humans synthesized elements of both bonobos and chimpanzees. But compared to each other, bonobos are more in, or relatively kind, gentle, and harmonious. Chimpanzees are more young, are active, systematizing, and aggressive. Clearly, humanity's long history combines elements of both lineages. But as the latest scientific studies show, the arc of biological evolution bends towards gentleness, cooperation, peace, and harmony. Our human heritage includes many ancestral species. These range from Australopithecus afrenus, who lived about 4 million years ago and walked upright. Uh, you may recall Lucy uh, was the prototypical mother of humanity, Lucy. Homo habilis lived about 2 million years ago and used the first stone tools and developed speech. This species was followed by Homo erectus, who lived from 1.8 to 1 million years ago and discovered fire and cooking. Then there were uh, two species, one Neanderthalus and the second Denisovans, who were both robust, more northerly human cousins who lived about 750,000 years ago and made exquisite, exquisite art and jewelry. Our own species, sapiens, emerged only about 310,000 years ago in Africa and spread around the world and gave rise, of course, to ancient medieval and modern culture and civilization. This particular uh, slide or 
illustration shows the logarithmic increase in brain size and cognitive capacity of these different human species. Okay, Darwinian evolution and modern science emphasize the primary role that meat played in human development and attribute intellect, cultural development, and health and vitality to increasing consumption of animal protein. According to George Osawa and Micho Kushi, however, this model is completely <laughs> erroneous. It corresponds with 19th century empires, with Victorian society, and with the excessive way of eating during that era but it ignores the vast experience of the overwhelming majority of the world's people who have ever lived. In the macrobiotic view, cereal grains constituted principal food of our prehistoric ancestors and formed the central part of diets in virtually every <coughs> historic, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> culture and civilization until the early modern era and industrialization. A wealth of recent scientific evidence has emerged confirming that sapiens ate grain as principal food and meat and other animal food was a very small supplemental part of the diet. For example, at the University of Colorado in Boulder, researchers report several years ago that our earliest human ancestors evolved several million years ago when some individuals started to eat wild grasses, in other words, whole grains. Anthropology professor Matt, Matt Sponheiner was quoted, quote, high tech tests on both tooth enamel by researchers indicate that prior to about 4 million years ago, Africa's hominids were eating essentially chimpanzee style, dining on fruits and some leaves. But a new look at the diets of ancient African hominids now shows a game change occurred 3.5 million years ago when some members added grasses to their menus. When this news first came out in 2013, I immediately went into Boston and showed it to Micho Kushi. And I thought he would be thrilled that finally there was evidence confirming theory that he'd been lecturing on for 50 years. And of course, he was uh, uh, pleased uh, that this was, had now turned up. But he also uh, was a little bit indignant because he said the scientists still did not get it right. He said the actual dating went back about twice as far to 10 million years ago. And he said they will, they will find that evidence at some point, but they were still had a long way to go. All right, so the principal wild grasses uh, for both uh, prehistoric humanity and then historic humanity are sorghum, which was the first and original grain in Africa, rice, millet, barley, wheat, and others. Myths from around the world celebrate cereal grains as the foundation of the golden age when nature was so abundant, the grains were freely available for everyone to eat and no cultivation was necessary. Gatherer hunters then as today consume about 80% of their diet in the form of plants and only 20% in the form of animal food. Traditional bands, tribes and cultures were egalitarian, peaceful and devoted most of their life to art, music, dance and crafts. In the archeological record, prehistoric art, megalithic architecture and other artifacts are now bearing witness to this grain-based uh, foundation. Okay, in historical times, war emerged following the agrarian revolution. So we're talking about 5,000 years ago when the concept of property and land ownership first emerged. 
the rise of city-states, of monarchy, of priest and priesthood, of slavery, and eventually of police forces and standing armies transform the world into a battleground. From a dietary or energetic point of view, these changes resulted from two factors. Number one, the switch to eating cultivated rather than wild grains. And then number two, to the increasing role that males, that men took in producing food. The switch to farming resulted in a decline in health and consciousness as people ate more domesticate, domestic, domestically grown food. Also, onless grains, particularly rice, displaced awned varieties. Awns are the long bristles or hairs at the top of the growing grains. They attract and transmit the higher waves and vibrations of the infinite universe. Though the awns are discarded when processed, their key energy is absorbed in the cooked food. Onless varieties spread throughout the Far East, especially in China and Japan, as they were easier to process, resulted in higher yields, and were cheaper to produce. This switch led to material well-being and technological development, but at the expense of spiritual insight and understanding. These celestial images of truth, beauty, and love that have been known by different names in different periods of human history. They range from Plato's ideals or forms to the music of the spheres or to cosmic consciousness. There are many names for this energy that is coming in from the cosmos and which is gathered and collected like antenna through the awns of the grains that we eat. In the West, interestingly, barley and wheat remained on from ancient times up to the present day, because unlike rice, they gave rise to higher yields. They have actually a different chemical uh, basis. Their use in bread and baked goods, however, created a more conceptual analytical way of thought. And monoculture in particular created a linear way of thinking. Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism and Islam all develop cosmologies of a sharp descent or fall of man as virtue declined from age to age. The Enlightenment and modern society reversed this pattern and adopted uh, the opposite approach, but still a linear one in which they saw history as a linear ascent or upward progress into the future. They were mirror images of each other, but still linear. Following the agrarian revolution, an even more momentous change occurred when women lost control of the food supply. In hunter-gatherer societies, women are responsible, as I indicated, for securing about 75 to 80% of the daily food supply, mostly plant quality foods, while men supply only about 20-25% by hunting or fishing. Women also served as the earliest physicians, as they were familiar with local herbs and plants. With farming, the superior upper body strength of males led them to take charge of plowing the fields and breeding the animals. As a result, they soon gained control of what food was produced and women no longer determined what was eaten and how it was prepared. I think this is the single biggest turning point in all of human history. Because <laughs> women not only lost control of the food supply, but they very quickly uh, lost their own autonomy. As a division of labor arose, men outside tending to the crops and the animals, women inside tending to the cleaning, cooking, and child care. And with the rise of property and ownership of land for tilling, women soon became property themselves. They lost their freedom and 
historically, they actually became the first slaves before prisoners of war even. And they have been subservient to males ever since. So this is a huge change that took place. Okay, in the last several years, I've been writing uh, along uh, a book called Spiral of History, which is now uh, in its uh, published five volumes. I'm working on volume six right now. And, uh, and in this series, I identify uh, complex societies in Europe, Pakistan, India, Africa, South America, and Australia that each flourished for more than a thousand years without central government without religion or violence or warfare. These remarkable cultures included then the Minoan, where I visited, the Indus Sarasvati Valley in uh, Northwest Pakistan and India, the Niger River Valley in West Africa and present day Mali, uh, Nordo Chico, the earliest civilization in the Americas in Peru, and the ancestral aboriginals in Australia. All of these ancient civilizations were devoted to nature, to art, and to trade, and had sophisticated sciences and technologies. But at each one, there were no rulers, no kings, no queens, no priests, no priestesses, no fortifications, no offensive weapons, no armies, no war. And I've dubbed them or called them the five peaceful civilizations. Several of them have only been discovered in recent decades, and they're virtually all are missing from school textbooks. Okay, in contrast, we are led to believe that civilization began in Sumer, in Egypt, in China, in Vedic India, in ancient Israel, in Greece, Rome, and in pre-Columbian North, Central, and South America. For all too long, we have assumed that monarchy and temple worship, that subordination of females, that the division of rich and poor, slavery, military, bloodshed and war, and environmental destruction are natural and inevitable. All of these cultures and civilizations, uh, in turn, ate substantially more animal food than the five peaceful civilizations. Clearly, <laughs> these eight complex societies are the seeds of today's polarized and fractured world. <clears throat> but there's nothing inevitable about <clears throat> the dietary imbalance and violent extremes that they embody <clears throat> and bequeath to us. Okay, whole grains served as principal food in nearly all the past civilizations and cultures as we've seen. In ancient Egypt, people ate barley as their main grain and processed it into bread and beer. Barley is celebrated throughout the Iliad and the Odyssey as the main food of the Aegean and Mediterranean worlds, the foundation of health, vitality, and divine favor. In the ancient Holy Land, Jesus fed the multitudes with loaves of barley bread as recorded in the Gospels and in the Quran, Muhammad sings the praises of wheat and barley, even though the kingdom over which he ruled was more desert based. In China, millet was the principal grain for thousands of years and created a civilization based on values of temperance, balance, and the middle way. It's extolled in the I Ching, the Tao Te Ching, and in the Confucian classics. <clears throat> And millet gives a simple practical energy and a kind sympathetic mind. In India, wheat ruled in the north and rice in the south. Prince Siddhartha chewed a bowl of softly prepared brown rice under the Bodhi tree and became the Buddha or an awakened one. Rice, which gives a strong unifying mind, also prevailed in Southeast Asia, in East Asia, including uh, southern parts of China and Japan and in Persia. In contrast to the ordinary people 
were eating mostly grains and vegetables, the emperors, pharaohs, kings, and aristocratic elites ate much richer food, especially meat and poultry, dairy and sweets, spices, and alcohol. In Africa, whole grains served also as principal food, as we've seen. These included finger millet and pearl millet in the central part of the continent, brown rice in the west, teff in the east, and sorghum in the south. In the New World, the Americas, wild grains nourished millennia of native people. North America, wild rice was the main staple in many regions. South America, quinoa and amaranth reigned supreme. While in Central America, the cultivation of maize, a high yielding crop that enhances the emotions and spiritual radiance, displaced wild millet and spread north and south and quickly established itself as the principal food, uh, not only in Central America, but in North and South America as well. Okay, life moves in a spiral and spirals are among the earliest forms of art around the world. There is this marvelous and order and unity to history and human affairs, including the rise and fall of cultures and civilizations, as there is to the helical development of galaxies, solar systems, subatomic particles, DNA, and plants and animals. The spiral of history, a basic model introduced by Micho Kushi, can be divided into 12 sections like a clock. But because of the logarithmic nature of the spiral, the hours or ages are not equal in size or duration, but like a chambered nautilus shell, trace a graceful curve. The spiral traces a broad curvilinear pattern for the last 5,000 years, from about 3200 BCE to 2100 of a common era. History does not History does repeat itself to an extent, or it rhymes, as Mark Twain put it. For example, the Crusades and the Mongol invasions of the Middle Ages fall in the same section as the World Wars in our modern era. The European discovery and exploration of the Western Hemisphere, prefigured space exploration and the race to the moon between the superpowers during the Cold War. Today's COVID epidemic or pandemic actually replicates to some extent the Black Death in the late Middle Ages. The quality of each section is the same. The main difference is that in the past, the pace of life was slower and each era lasted longer. Today, the ages are converging at breakneck speed and the entire spiral spanning the entire existence of our species is coming to a climax. After thousands of years, the long winding spiral of history is now cresting, viewed as an inward moving centripetal curve as we see in this illustration. We're moving through the very center of the spiral. The pace of modern life is accelerating rapidly. All boundaries are dissolving. Everything is converging. All familiar institutions are breaking down. Family, the church, school, hospital, brick and mortar stores, <clears throat> unions, even the nation state. Age old concepts of race, sex, gender, matter and spirit are in breathtaking flux. In the final revolution of the spiral, fast food, bionics, climate change, monoculture, GMOs, digital empires, gene editing, virtual and augmented realities are rapidly remaking our world and leading toward an existential climax between our species and artificial intelligence. Self-replicating algorithms and new neural networks are displacing human beings in many domains, including transportation and communications, finance, law, medicine, and others. A complementary opposite trend rooted in whole foods and organic agriculture in integrative medicine, green technology, meditation and mindfulness 
strives to maintain natural biological and spiritual evolution and help us pass safely through this cataclysmic time, create a sustainable future and a world of enduring health and peace. Okay, this slide simply shows uh, the schematic of the three main revolutions in human history, in the spiral of history, the agrarian revolution from approximately uh, 3200 BCE to the Renaissance. And then from the Renaissance, uh, beginning of the industrial era uh, up to approximately 1980, when the first computers uh, personal computers came out and led to the digital revolution. So those are the three big revolutions. And you can see each one is approximately one third as long as the previous revolution. So we're right at the center of the spiral right now. This spiral actually ends in the year, roughly in the year 2036. So we're, we've got about, what, four, 14 years. And we'll be looking a little bit about that further as we talk about emergence of new species of human beings. Okay, the, the diagram that I showed you just a minute ago, the original spiral of history diagram that Micho uh, developed was a young contracting spiral and it showed uh, the increasing material and technological advance and accelerating speed of the ages as they unfold. This diagram presents a complementary opposite view of the spiral. This is an expanding or centrifugal, more in view of what's happening. And also we can see today this last turn of the spiral on where we are and where we are headed. Right now, in my view, we are in quadrant eight up here about 10 o'clock in the evening. This is broadly governed by nationalism. And so some of the things that are happening now include uh, in gender equality, gender identity, that's at the forefront of things. That's more on a personal level, but it's also being affected at a social level with the identity of nations. Uh, and we're seeing that right now, particularly in the uh, war in Ukraine, as Russia uh, asserts itself as, uh, as a empire of, you know, in their view of the empire is very similar to the one before that gave rise to World War II, actually, as those in World War I, as those empires then came into conflict. And then we're gonna, and, and because these are happening so rapidly, they're all converging now, we'll see that the next, uh, we're partly also in, in the uh, 11th house here, or the ninth house governed by internationalism. Pandemic presented an opportunity for the nations of the world to come together to deal with this health crisis, but it was managed very poorly. So it gave rise to medical autocracy and the surveillance state at many levels. Anyway, in each section, there's opportunity for, for advance or for uh, going in the opposite direction. But anyway, we're moving, as we can see, toward what we call planetary commonwealth or world government. And if the planet is to survive, particularly global warming and climate change, it's gonna to have to come together at some point soon. Anyway, this is a fascinating um, illustration. And, and, but we don't have time to go into too much further. So let's go on. All right. In my view, uh, when we talk about uh, human species, I don't want to make too much of this, but I think we can say that just in the ancient or in the prehistoric historic world where you had four or five species on the planet at one time, 
when you had Neanderthals, Denisovians, you had sapiens, and there's several smaller species all coexisting. I think today we have, in some sense, uh, we have several, uh, at least different orientations among our present day human beings. So just to sum up this, this particular slide uh, shows Homo sapiens, and I looked at uh, the year in which they came out roughly 310, 15,000 years ago, at least according to the latest scientific evidence uh, in East Africa, and then they began to appear in the Middle East and elsewhere. Principal food, as we saw, was wild, particularly on grains, supplemental food, uh, you know, all natural quality, small amount of animal food. Uh, so we're familiar with Homo sapiens. And of course, we all today are predominantly Homo sapiens. Uh, so we have that lineage today. But then, this is what I consider to be the main dominant type of person today. And I've dubbed, I've dubbed that person supermarket man. And excuse the sexism, but I saw this in an article years ago and it startled me because it was described in a feature story that people who are shopping in supermarkets, you know, in, in effect, you know, had to or a new species. And I, I love that ever since. So I found what the Latin equivalent was, which was Homo Macellius. And anyway, supermarket man. Uh, uh, really began, in my view, in the mid 19th century. And there were just several key events leading up to this. I think 1859 is a key date because that was the date when the origin of species was introduced or, or published by Charles Darwin. And also that same year, the great uh, Atlantic and Pacific uh, Tea Company, known as uh, A&P, the first large supermarket chain in the United States uh, uh, began. And it was roughly this time too that in, uh, Germany, Justus von Liebig, who's known as the father of modern nutrition, was the one who popularized animal protein as the main nutrient for human beings. And it was on the basis of his uh, uh, books on chemistry that the protein, uh, the protein became the, the chief food and then that was tied in with the doctrine of evolution that species higher up on the food chain, eating more animal food, were at the top and those who were more vegetarian were at the bottom. And this formed the ideological foundation for imperialism in the 19th and early 20th century. So that in England and France and Germany and, and uh, other great empires, they all looked at their civilizing mission around the world was to introduce healthier, more nutritious diets based on meat, poultry, and dairy food. And so they roundly criticized people were eating plant foods. Anyway, very interesting. And then at the end of the 19th century, Fanny Farmer, who wrote the most famous cookbook in American history, um, introduced the standard modern diet which is based on a large meat entree with some kind of potatoes complementing, complementing it with several side dishes, uh, a large fresh raw salad, and then a huge sweet dessert, cake or pie, then followed by coffee and whatever. But anyway, she's really the mother of the standard American diet. And her books are totally amazing. Uh, she's also the first a uh, female instructor at Harvard Medical School. And she created the modern hospital diet too, which was the total opposite. It was totally bland, uh, almost tasteless diet. So very interesting uh, study of yin and yang. Um, and then A.O. Atwater, who I mentioned there at the bottom of that column was the chemist for the USDA, who was the one who introduced the calorie as the main uh, yardstick for nutrition. and 
he was the one who then created the protein um, recommendations, which are two to three times greater than, than conventional nutritionists recommend today. He was up to 125 grams per person per day. So in other words, these people, particularly Liebig, Farmer, and Atwater, set the stage for the modern degenerative disease in the 20th century. Very clearly, it resulted from this modern way of eating. And so we have the epidemics of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, et cetera. And to some extent, World War I, World War II, Cold War, and everything that followed. Okay, so that's supermarket man. Okay, then uh, next is Homo Pacificus, peaceful person. Again, this is really same as Homo uh, sapien, but it's someone who's attained peace in their own life or has what I guess we call social consciousness. You may re remember the seven levels of consciousness that George Osawa and Micho introduced as a basic pattern of of human awareness, the stages that we go through as natural human beings. And that what we call peace is basically the fifth level. It's social judgment, social awareness, the concern for people outside of ourselves. So that means not only family members, but community, nation, world, environment, other uh, living beings and so forth. So, uh, and so that's pretty much the same as the gatherer hunter diet, the prehistoric diet that we looked at. It's really not so very different. In fact, I look at those gatherer hunter people as specific peaceful people, as examples of this kind of orientation. Okay, then uh, beyond this, uh, as Micho taught, then was homo spiritus, spiritual person. Again, very similar to what we just looked at, but this is more on the sixth level of judgment. You go from social awareness to what he called philosophical or spiritual or even ideological awareness. And this has to do then with looking at the larger cosmic dimensions of life, looking at the meaning of life and our relation to uh, God or infinity or however you like to call it and why we are here as human beings. Where did we come from? Where will we go? All of those questions about our origin and our destiny. And the one difference actually in dietary practice between Homo pacificus and Homo spiritus is that Homo spiritus minimizes animal food and is virtually vegan. Again, it may, may be certain parts of the world where that's not practical, but for the most part, uh, no animal food is eaten. So that allows the energy channel, the chakras and so forth to receive the full energy of the cosmos. Whereas Homo pacificus, the one that we looked at before, or the one before, see the small part of can be healthy. Uh, animal food can be eaten from about five to 20% to maintain your usual good health and consciousness and peacefulness. So this is why historically people who ate animal food are not necessarily violent or warlike. And, and I very much disagree with people who say that you have to be 100% vegan uh, to be peaceful. That's not true. And, uh, but I think the world is tending more toward vegan now as we become more spiritual and particularly now for environmental and ecological reasons. But meat itself can be eaten as a small part of the natural uh, diet and has been. And so a lot of peace people historically and even today can have this kind of mixed diet. It's still plant-based. But I think that's an important point to bring out here. Okay, choice of futures. So what's happening right now is that the, as we say, the spiral of history is, is rapidly ending. Uh, and there'll be a period of transition from uh, roughly 2036, when the spiral of history ends, that 25,000 year cycle ends, 
and then a new uh, cycle begins. And for those of you who know something about nine star key, you will know that the last part of the 25,000 year cycle um, is an 81 year cycle dominated by fire energy. And that too is now ending and will be replaced by a new uh, uh, 81 year cycle governed by eight soil. And that starts in roughly 2036 and will go to 2117. And if you look at this, these diagrams uh, closely, um, you'll see that the end, the end point is, is slightly different. One is 21, one is 2040 and one is 2100. And uh, I worked with Micho. We actually stayed up all one night in those uh, uh, early 1980s because at that time he was lecturing on spiral history and when he only went up to, to 1980 because that's what the you know roughly the year was and i said well what goes beyond this you know for the last turn of the spiral so we actually stayed up all night and and worked it out and this was what came up with but he said there's a that transition period is such that uh there's an 81 year difference roughly between the, the more positive direction here on the right and the more negative direction on the left. And so that that coming eight, 81 year, eight year uh, governed by eight soil is a time of transition or change where all human institutions will undergo revolutionary transformation. It's very hard to predict what will happen. There are two, two key indicators that we'll look at in a few minutes, though. OK, so right now we are at the center of the spiral. Uh, this is governed uh, by Yang energy because we're moving into the center. And so speed is being is picking up. So it's high energy, high speed, high temperature, high density, high pressure, high production and consumption, high efficiency, high caloric, high protein diets, fast circulation, fast and short attention span. So these are all common elements of what everybody's going through at the moment. OK, this is. Uh, the, these cycles are also tied in with what I mentioned before, the 25,800 year cycle, which is known as the uh, precession of the equinoxes. It has to do with the parent uh, position of the North Star overhead. Right now, the, uh, the North Star is Polaris. When we look up in the night sky, we see Polaris. And But if uh, we lived 3,000 years ago, the North Star would have been different. It would have been uh, here in uh, uh, the Great Dipper would be pointing to a different star. It's very interesting how the stars change. So there have been about eight to 10 North Stars during this period as the Earth wobbles and the North Star changes. But the point is that because of this change, of energy overhead, there's a different shower of cosmic vibration that hits the Earth. So it can be either more or less, depending on the angle of the Milky Way, which is presented over here on the right. And when the Milky Way is directly overhead, there are billions of stars shining their energy on the Earth. So it is highly charged. And so that was known as the Golden Age or the Age of Paradise. But that that was 15 to 20,000 years ago. And then when the energy shift shifted, then that consciousness was lost. The plants no longer flourished and grew themselves. And so people were forced into great uh, suffering. And so uh, long ages of subsistence. And then finally with the warming period, agriculture reemerged and then people started to grow food to make their living, to stay alive. 
and the whole cycle oscillates between two stars, Vega and Polaris. Polaris is our current North Star. Vega was the one approximately halfway back. And these are associated with two different types of Earth changes. In Vega, it was with the destruction by water, which is remembered as a flood or a series of floods. Today, the destruction we face is by fire. So it's opposite. And so there are many different fire phenomena that we are facing right now. And these include <clears throat> nuclear war is number one. And, and this year, I think as we all know, the nuclear threat is greater than it has ever been since 1962 in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Very, very dangerous period right now. And especially those of you who know Nine, nine Star Key know that in a five soil year, it's the most heightened likelihood for war to break out. And it has already broken out, but it could still uh, escalate much further. World War I began in a five soil year. World War II began in a five soil year. Civil War, Korean War, one after another. So it's very dangerous time we're living in at the present. But other types of fire phenomena include artificial electromagnetic radiation of all kinds, uh, global warming, uh, vanishing nutrients, new epidemics and vaccines, biological degeneration, cyber war, loss of biodiversity, genetic engineering. All of these are ways in which um, the world can collapse. Uh, and most of these are fire-based phenomena to some extent or another. Okay, so as this, uh, uh, what we may call the modern world is rapidly declining and coming to a climax, there's a new world that is being born uh, and is moving in an outward, more centrifugal direction, creating a new spiral. And this is characterized by natural and organic food and agriculture, by green energy, by transmutation of elements, by sexual and gender equality, racial and social justice, by the abolition of nuclear weapons and energy, and then eventually planetary commonwealth and new spiritual orientation to life. So this is happening uh, now all over the planet. It's not as visible, it's not on the mass, it's on, not in the news or in the mass media, so to speak but it's happening all around us. And I think many of us are part of this to some extent or another. And so this is gaining, slowly gaining momentum. And if we can avoid the, the worst aspects of the fire civilization that is now coming to a head, hopefully we can move then into this new era in the 2030s and 40s and beyond and create a, uh, a new more peaceful and spiritually oriented civilization. Now, the keys to doing this, Micho said, were, were two. Number one, he said, was the uh, transmutation of elements. And this is based on the theory that George Osawa first developed. This is Osawa's spiral of the elements, totally different from the periodic table, which is a linear table, which is very static, and which puts elements in a grid in which they can combine as compounds, but you cannot change one element into another except through uh, nuclear uh, reactions. But this chart shows that the elements, there's no hard fixed boundaries. And in fact, they are constantly uh, moving spiralically, naturally changing one into another as they move into the center toward radioactivity with hydrogen, helium, and, and lithium and so forth here on the outside. And in the 1960s, Osawa uh, uh, did a pioneer experiment in which he changed uh, carbon into iron and sodium into potassium. And he showed that this could be done. He did it in a very small, tiny scale in a laboratory in Japan. And then Micho has been lecturing, lectured about this for many decades. And then about uh, 10, 12 years ago, uh, some colleagues and myself, we started a, a, a little company to carry these 
studies further. We called it quantum rabbit after the rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. And uh, so we did a whole series of experiments in which, in using vacuum tubes, we were able to take uh, small amounts of uh, many types of industrial and precious metals and change them then into our common, we use very common ordinary metal uh, elements and change them into industrial or precious uh, metals of all kinds. So it was really fascinating study. So it's, and so proof of concept was our goal just to show that it could be done. And the next stage is to show that this can be done on a, on a large or what we call industrial level. And uh, so our articles were published in um, in scientific uh, alternative science magazines and were, were very well received. And um, so we're hopeful that we can interest now some companies or, or philanthropists or, or commercial investors into taking this to the next step. Because Micho said this was absolutely essential for a peaceful world was to create an abundance of material energy so that we have enough for everybody. And this will also end mining and help clean up the environment because there's no need for mining if you can, you know, create um, iron from carbon or if you can uh, create titanium from uh, uh, silicon or beach sand, which we've done. So this is the future really of a material civilization, but it has an energetic or spiritual component. So he says this was the, the economic foundation for a peaceful and spiritual world. And then number two was what uh, he called world government, but that was that idealistic movement from uh, post-World War II. And uh, we've been calling it planetary commonwealth, which has a less ominous ring than in government because it's very easy to abuse uh, things. So the, the world commonwealth is more like a service agency that would uh, begin to uh, serve the planet as a whole, something like NASA or you know Environmental Protection Agency, but at many different levels around the planet. So he says those are the two really preconditions for creating a healthy, peaceful world. But he was hopeful that in uh, beginning then in the 2030s and 40s, the transmutation will really begin to become practical, and that this would then help unify the planet. And also one of the great uh, goals of transmutation is to take radioactive materials of which there are literally, literally millions of tons around the planet, which is the world's biggest environmental problem, bar none, because they will last for literally millions of years. And to transmute them again into common elements or beach sand, that can be done. And that can be done quickly. There's no other solution on the horizon. Putting them in salt mines will not work. It may protect them for a few thousand years, but salt mines are subject to earthquakes. And that will end, that will release all that radioactivity back into the environment. So there, literally there is no other solution on the horizon than transmutation. And given the Ukrainian war and what's going on today, this is even more urgent than ever. All right, so that concludes my presentation. This is just uh, showing the covers of the five volumes of the Spiral of History from which my talk has been developed. These are available on my website or our group planetaryhealth.com. Okay, so I will get out of uh, the slideshow here. Well, okay. okay, so we're out of the share screen. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'd be happy to take a few questions if there are any. Well, I'll jump in uh, with my question. I guess two questions. Uh, the second one is if you're optimistic. And the first one 
is there's been some discussion recently about the role of vegan in macrobiotic practice. Some say optional and some say necessary. I wonder if you have any comment. Yeah, well, number one, I am very optimistic because I think it was <laughs> okay. a clear path forward. And I think that path forward is made all the more uh, uh, possible or, or uh, potential by our belief and by our acting in a positive, hopeful manner. So I think that it's something like a wave motion, you know, that, that waves are unpredictable, but they depend to a certain extent on the, uh, on the observer. They're influenced by the observer. This is a cardinal principle of, of particle physics and that you cannot separate subject and object. So when we look at a, it's at something, we're actually part of it. And so our mind and our feelings affect what we see and believe. So in other words, mm -hmm, if, we're, mm -hmm. if we're moving forward, there's no guarantee that we will succeed. That's, so I'm realistic in that regard. It's not inevitable, but it's certainly possible. And I think very likely it, all, it really takes only a small group of people to change the world. And um, Margaret Mead had that famous quote about, yeah, she says that's all it, that's all it ever took to change the world was a small group of people. And so we, we can do that. The second question about vegan, well, I think in my talk I, and in my books, I've emphasized uh, taking a very broad view uh, that throughout human history, people have eaten a small amount of animal food. And as Mitchell taught, that was about one seventh or one eighth, right? Seven to one ratio for those who, who like it. But he also taught, and I would agree that for spiritual practice, it's ideal not to take any animal food. And, 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 and animal food has a great value for some people medicinally, for others, not so much. And I think in ancient times or in prehistoric times, people had, had amazing um, connections with the animal world. And so the animals, in fact, because it's very hard to hunt, it's very difficult actually to do it on a sustainable basis because animals have better senses, right? They can see better, they can hear better. They're very easy to avoid human beings as a rule. And so what happened in, in the prehistoric world was that they created a, a, there was a cultural spiritual understanding with the animal world that they would sacrifice themselves to be eaten in order to uh, help humanity survive. So they're actually part of the evolutionary process and all the rituals were, were uh, geared toward uh, recognizing that the animals had actually sacrificed their lives for human beings and that the humans in turn would pray for the animal spirits. It's amazing. We find that even in the Odyssey and the, and the Iliad, right? You know, that's relatively modern, only several thousand years ago that all of the sacrifices in the Homeric epics, they always ask the animal beforehand whether, whether it's okay to kill them. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And if the animal does not give the permission, they won't, they won't do it. It's very different from, you know, factory farming today, <laughs> for sure. But then to fast forward to the present, I would say that practically speaking, um, animal food is not ecological today at all. And, and it's destroying the environment for sure in the oceans if you're eating fish. So I think the less, the better. Uh, and so we may be moving to a period where at least for the foreseeable future, again, maybe for medicinal reasons, maybe if you're living in the far north, you know, you're an Inuit or something, yes. But for practically speaking, less the better. So, uh, but, I, but I don't make it a 100% rule. And, 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 the, and the phrase that we've been using for our, our seminars and, and conferences often, we call, uh, we've been appealing to what we call smart vegan. So smart and vegan means mostly uh, plant-based quality, but also smart, meaning no, dare, no uh, sugar, right? No white flour or minimal. So it's very different from vegan. In fact, my biggest concern right now in terms of food is 
it's very clear that the planet is to survive. We're going to become vegan. The whole planet is moving in that direction right now. All the authorities are agreed. All the international agencies, are, you know, that's all on their, their talking points right now. Eat less meat. There's no disagreement on that. The question, though, is what quality of vegan? And again, so you have the world splitting in two different directions. You have more natural quality represented by macrobiotics and perhaps some other you know, natural food movement. But then you have this fake vegan movement, which is moving toward artificial vegan, right? So you're getting all these meat analogs. You're getting highly ultra processed vegan food. You're getting test tube meat, you know, and GMO vegan and whatever it might be. And again, I, that's what I'm worried about most is that kind of vegan may triumph over natural vegan. That's a problem. Because that will not create a healthy, peaceful world. Mm -hmm. I have a okay. question, Alex. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned this uh, experiment that you did with the materials, and it was published in an alternative scientific journal. Yes. Can you tell me where it was published? What journal was it? Yeah, the, the main journal is called Infinite Energy. Yeah. Yeah, I think you'll probably find it online under that, that name. Are there other uh, journals that you call uh, semi-scientific or alternative scientific that you're aware of? Well, that, that's the main one in the United States right now. And we contributed after we did a series of experiments, we would write articles summarizing our experiments and, and submitting it to that journal. We, we did our own books, like uh, we did a book called Cool Fusion, which summarizes I think it's probably available on my website, planetaryhealth.com. Cool. Uh, anyway, we've done several books. Also, uh, Edward Esco uh, revised uh, and put a lot of this material together in, in his revision of Micho's book on the Philosopher's Stone, which mm -hmm. also introduces the whole theory of transmutation. So that's an excellent book. Okay, thank you. Alex? Yeah. Yes? Alex, yes. it's Carol. Oh, hey, Carol. Hi. hi. Yeah, hi. hi. So um, thank you for the excellent uh, research and presentation. It's brilliant as usual. <laughs> and um, I just want to uh, commend your peacefulness that I see in your countenance and your being and your, I can feel your, your joy and your happiness. And I'm, I'm really honoring that. Oh, and yeah. yeah, that's so good. Such a good example for us. And <clears throat> two questions. One, I know if we have time, uh, Gennad, do we have time? Sure. Great. So one, Alex, you were starting to speak about um, the violence and the gun, uh, gun people. And you were starting to say about fast food. But I would, I, I would like, I didn't hear the whole end of that. I don't know if you were able to end it. And number two, um, if you've had COVID, you're experiencing COVID and you've had it seven, eight days and you can't seem to kick it out, you're still testing positive on the rapid test. What do you advise or anybody? What do you advise? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure about the first question uh, you just said about guns and, and violence, but uh, I would like to, to just um, uh, briefly address the, you know, the gun situation here in the United yes. States, which is unique, maybe not so much in the rest of the world, but we've had this epidemic of school shootings uh, this, this spring. Of course, that's, it's, it's, unfortunately, it began in um, 19, 1998, uh, I believe, with the um, uh, in Colorado, uh, the name of I forget the name of the school, but anyway, it was the Columbine. first mass. Columbine. Yeah, the first yes. was at Columbine, and ever since there have now been hundreds of of school shootings, 
and it's a huge epidemic and it's of course it's it's related to uh, uh, the prevalence of guns in the United States. There are more guns than there are people. And that's certainly uh, a huge problem. But I think from, a, from an energetic or macrobiotic point of view, uh, what's, what's, what's happening is that um, the school shootings coincided. They came within uh, just about the same time that GMO food was introduced in this country and uh which was in roughly 1996 97 98 just about the same time and most people don't know this and i didn't until i researched it but uh it's fascinating that when they when they initially genetically engineered uh, a species for example soybeans or maize or corn the scientists could not combine the genes of one species into another because the natural immunity and resistance of each species was so strong they 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 rejected the genes that were they tried to splice into them it was really amazing it was a good example of how strong and resilient nature is so some clever scientists came up with a method to introduce the, the gen genetic material of one species and combine it with another. And you know what they came up with? <laughs> they took a Petri dish and they put the target species in the Petri dish. And then they took a miniature revolver and they put the DNA into a bullet and they shot it into the Petri dish. That was how genetic, that's genetic engineering. It's born out of a gun, literally a gun. It's called a gene gun. That's how they were able to combine. And so that, that's how the first lines of GMO foods were introduced. They were literally, their parentage, their ancestry was gun-based. And so quickly that went into the food supply, that line, you know, mace, corn and soybeans, which are now in 70% of all processed foods in the supermarket, and maybe 90% in school cafeterias. And so when children start eating that food and absorbing that kind of violent energy, which is not, again, it's not natural. It's not from, you know, the sun, the moon, and the stars and the rain. It's from a Petri dish and a gun blast. So naturally, that may have influenced them. Anyway, that's my theory. And, and uh, uh, I think it, it could certainly bear uh, uh, research because many of these school shootings, as you know, are, are done by people working in, in uh, uh, fast food outlets. Many of them occur in fast food outlets outside of schools. Anyway, the, that whole ethos is there. And many of the shooters, you know, they then go to, to a hamburger place right afterward or beforehand to eat. I mean, it's just crying out for research and study. So it's intimately involved. And then the second, oh, then you asked me about COVID. Uh, well, I think each person is a little bit different, but I, the main uh, uh, remedy that we use, you know, for strengthening natural immunity would be ume, uh, shokuzu, or at least some kind of a kuzu drink. Uh, problem with COVID is that people um, uh, who, who, who are eat, getting COVID tend to eat animal food. So, um, uh definitely they should be avoiding animal food if you know if they're subject to infection or if they're still testing positive yeah thank you yeah. okay i just asked a question alex about uh, listening to your comments about peaceful civilizations uh, in the past. Um, I just wonder, should we give up on religion? I didn't hear that. So I'm saying your comments about uh, the peaceful civilizations. Um, and I just wondered whether we should actually give up on religion now. Uh -huh. well, give we should up give on up it. on religion. Give up on religion. Uh, 
I no, I don't necessarily uh, believe in giving up on religion. I actually, uh, I, <clears throat> I must confess, I have kind of a Marxist view on religion, and and Marx. Opiate of the, the masses. Had the famous statement that religion is the opiate of the people. Uh, but what is most people don't recognize is the, is the next phrase in the sentence that he said. He said, religion is not only the opiate of the people, it's the heart of the heartless world. So, so I think religion offers comfort and, and hope for many people. And I, and I don't think it can be eliminated until, again, all of the preconditions for, for social change are met. And so, in my view, I think religion does serve a, a pop, a, a generally serves a, a useful purpose. Uh, however, it can easily be abused. Like Mitra always said, the wor his view, he said, the worst thing in human history was the wars of religion and that religion fostered hatred of other people and other uh, other communities and other religions. And so we're seeing this now today, for example, in India. Uh, we're seeing it you know, in, in other places where uh, the governments are, are actively fueling uh, religious warfare. And so it's extraordinarily destructive. But I think at a personal level, there's still a, a role for it. Um, Alex, this is Evelina, and um, I'd like to uh, make a say, make a comment that you could comment on. Sure. Um, <clears throat> one thing is one thing. One thing, the lesser thing that I want to say is um, just to, like the total vegan idea has never appealed to me, and that's partly because I live in Alaska now in a very strong fish town. And it just doesn't make sense that the earth produces this and that people are not supposed to partake. And that's just, you know, kind of gut feeling when you live around here. But the other thing is your presentation has been excellent, has relaxed my soul in certain ways. And um, a long time ago, there's an author named Daniel Quinn, and I don't remember the name of his books. One of them had a movie made out of it, but he said, according to my memory, which isn't the best, but he said the first, something like the first bad thing or the first wrong thing that people ever did was locking up the food. And that statement hit me so strongly because I knew that gatherer hunter people would never lock up the food. I knew that locking up the food came with agriculture and the domestication of animals and all that. And um, it was profound. And then some of the things that you had said at the beginning said, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> And so, um, so thank you, thank you. And, and look up Daniel Quinn, if you can find, I mean, I think he's dead now, but you would recognize the movie if you find him, when you find him. Yeah, okay, Riala, thank you for the reference. I'll check it out. Yeah, that's a great quote, when they locked up the food. Yeah, well, that was it. Yeah, people were, were separated from nature and uh, they lost their, their contact with growing things. And, became dependent on, on, on the food that was uh, controlled by the priest or by the kings or whatever. And uh, yeah. Really amazing. Yeah. Anything else? Thanks. Um, I was interested in your statement about planetary commonwealth and how you actually bring that about without someone controlling uh, that process. Um, how do you bring that about in a fair way? Yeah, 
Well, that's an excellent question. I think that's going to be the uh, topic of debate over the next 50 years, actually, <laughs> is, is how to create a, you know, a, 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 a world that's responsive to all the people in it. I mean, one way is to do it not by countries, hopefully countries, you know, will fade away, but there'll be bioregions. So you, you know, or in other words, environmental people of the desert region or people of the lakes region or mountain regions, you know, different, you know, have similar interest or, or looking out for them. I think too, uh, when we talk about planetary commonwealth, we may want to start thinking also in terms of like traditional societies, indigenous societies who had tribal councils. Uh, and in, in this country, there's a concept called seven generations. And what that meant was that among the Iroquois and, and other people that they would, when they made a big decision, they would look at its impact over seven generations, not just, you know, the next quarter or the next year or the next four year term or whatever it might be, but literally seven generations. And, uh, and then also, too, in their tribal councils, sometimes people from different clans would represent the animals or plants from those clans. So they would consciously be representing, uh, you know, like the deer or the eagles or whatever it might be when the council as a whole met. So it's not just human council, not just human commonwealth, but planetary commonwealth. I think that's where it's going to probably move in the future, too. Well, shall we move into our thanks and appreciation? This was even more wonderful than I anticipated. It's such interesting ideas and so well researched. And I really appreciate, Alex, all of your work. Yeah, thank you, Dan. So, yes. The service that you're providing and all the friends who <laughs> are participating from week to week or month to month. Yeah. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And you know, we're making a big trip now to Macedonia. So looking forward to that. Well, that's Macrobiotic great. Macedonia. Yeah, or if you get a chance, parachute into Santorini. <laughs> yeah, huh? That's, uh, I'm, I was already thinking, oh, the next trip's got to be that. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Good. Well, thank you again. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. Great. Okay.